I'm Ryan Leone. Um, I'm an author. Um, I grew up in Santa Barbara, California. Grew up in a very normal uh, middle class family. Upper middle class? Upper middle class. Upper middle class family. They got me on one of those sensationalistic conspiracy cases where they're saying because I got the heroin from this person and they're connected to this person, it's this cartel. huge, yeah, they said I was part of this cartel called the Mendoza clan, LA Times, you know. When someone says that, you think you're fucking going to meetings in, the, in Mexico City or in the jungle with cartel members. It was nothing of the sort. I had, uh, you know, one connection, some fat lady in East LA, and it was, you know, I was buying a half pound, a pound of heroin, mostly for personal use, but they'd give it to me in individual balloons. So I got busted with a thousand balloons by the DEA. And while I was incarcerated, I wrote a novel called Wasting Talent. During that time, my book was published. I started doing a lot of readings, uh, headlining literary festivals. I saw some success, um, and then it got optioned as a, um, to be a film by William De Los Santos, who uh, is the screenwriter of Spun, and Chris Hanley, who produced American Psycho, Bully, uh, Spring Bra I think he did Spring Breakers, um, you know, a number of transgressive films in the independent world. I, I just got out of prison again, and there's a documentary about my life in production as well. Because I, I transitioned into full-blown addiction by the time I was 15. I was smoking crack, doing heroin, got expelled from three high schools within the span of a month when I was a teenager, and I spent most of my teenage years in institutions for troubled adolescents, reform schools. I'm running out of friends because I keep burning all my bridges. Everyone's getting sick of me. You know, everyone's getting sick of me borrowing 20 bucks. Everyone's getting sick of me asking for a place to stay. I've lost nine friends to heroin. I, I had some writing published when I was nine. I had a short story published and then uh, I went to a prestigious writing internship program outside of Boston in a place called Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, it's the first time I shot heroin. I, I shot up China White heroin out there in Worcester. And within a month, I got kicked out. And I basically was in and out of rehabs for the next, you know, I probably went to 21 rehabs and, you know, my parents were so desperate to try to save my life. I was just in and out of rehabs and other institutes, jails, rehabs. Um, I moved out to, I moved back to California and I started working with Spike TV. I was doing media um, brokering for them. Uh, those shows, Wildest Moments, caught on tape. I would buy like police chases or armed robbery footage. This was before the advent of YouTube, so... so you're buying it from the law enforcement? I'm buying it from law enforcement, and I'm buying non-exclusive rights, and then I'm selling it to Spike for a bit more. If I bought them for 300, I'm selling it for 500. So I started, um, you know, making some legitimate legal money. Around that time, I got, I was addicted to heroin, and I was addicted to crack, um, and just to facilitate my habit, I started selling drugs on a, on a much bigger level. Kilos of MDMA, Kilos, kilos of cocaine, of yeah, kilos of MDMA and cocaine, um, and eventually I got busted by the feds. So I had a, a connection for LSD, MDMA, psilocybin, ketamine, GHB, club drugs specifically. This is a guy that owned three houses, baller, looked like a complete dork, Abercrombie and Fitch, Drove a very modest car, Unlikely. no tattoos, not flashy like me. And he would always tell me, do not sell heroin, do not sell crystal meth, do not sell cocaine. Those drugs are on the radar. The things we're doing are club drugs. They don't fuck with us as long as we don't fuck with them. It's kind of like an unspoken truce with the DEA at that period for whatever reason. They were waging war back then on medical marijuana dispensaries. They were waging war on methamphetamine hard back then. And now it's more fat, they're going after fentanyl and heroin. But back then it was meth, crack, and, uh, and, and marijuana dispensaries. So what I was doing was outside of that, uh, the radar for law enforcement. So my connection said, don't ever do that. You know, I was making, like I said, $10,000 a week. Sometimes I was making 40,000 in one deal, just brokering kilos of molly. I could get seven of them for 70,000, 10,000 a piece, you know, and out back then ounces were going for $1,600. So the money was, was insane. You know, in the beginning, like I, I said, um, I was selling Molly 
and this is in 2006, 2007. It was way before it was popularized in, um, in culture. And now you hear about it in rap songs on the radio. Molly is just a big part of, of our culture right now. Uh, but back then it wasn't. I was, I, the first time I, I got my hands on it, it was the first time I'd ever even heard of it. And, and so it was hard to sell because nobody knew what it was. I'm like, it's powder ecstasy. But nobody, you know, they didn't trust powder, whatever, whatever the case. It wasn't as marketable back then. People don't trust powder, I guess. They don't want to eat it. Um, so I've, I essentially created the market there. I'd get the vegetable caps and put it in the little capsules, put 0.1 of the MDA or MDMA in it, and I'd sell it. And doing that, it just became very, uh, there was this like mass proliferation of ecstasy and ecstasy culture in that town. And kind of by default uh, and obliquely, everybody knew that I was the one pushing it. Everybody in Santa Barbara, you know, I had infiltrated the party scene, the college scene. Um, I went out to all the clubs and, you know, I'd started on a smaller scale, but then it got to kilos. And, you know, I'm selling um, ounces of it. Back then an ounce was going for 1600 and I was getting kilos for 12,000. So the profit margin was insane. But being on the fringe of that picturesque upper class society um, was a pretty, it was, there was an interesting contrast. Uh, and you know, when you're selling drugs, you get very delusional. Um, you have this false sense of inflated importance and you think that you're powerful because everybody's waiting on you and you go everywhere and everyone kisses your ass. Being in that town, you know, it wasn't as, it wasn't like I was selling it in Detroit. I didn't have to go around with a gun. I wasn't strapped. I was dealing with, it was just very- Safer. It was safer. It was a tranquil, I never felt threatened. By, at the end, I was making $10,000 a week. Um, I was laundering my money with art. I was buying lithographs. And I found that that was the best way to do it. You can buy lithographs from prolific artists like Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, Pablo Picasso. Uh, you know, for anywhere from like 5000 to uh, $500,000. And the reason that the lithographs were ever introduced into the art world was because people like Pablo Picasso or Andy Warhol catered to a very um, elite demographic and they wanted to expand their revenue by making these silkscreen lithographs. And I found out about that. I'm like, man, that's a perfect thing for a drug dealer. You buy a lithograph with cash from an art dealer. I'd find them in the yellow pages. And then in turn, I would sell those to a licensed art broker for a check. For a check. Boom, money's legal. Um, so the reason I brought up art in the first place is because those are the kind of, so as I started collecting art for nefarious purposes, I actually got into art and I got into appreciating art and I started hanging out in a, a much uh, higher social stratosphere than I was in. So I have this secret life where I'm a junkie, I'm shooting speedballs, heroin and cocaine every day, and then I'm going to art gallery shows or I'm going to Sotheby auctions, you know? Um, and it was just very interesting being in that town and being that kind of like a, a negative fixture. Because like I said, you have these false delusions where you think that you're more important than you are because everybody wants something from you. They, just want what, they don't want you, <laughs> they want what you got. They, they want what you got, but you don't, you don't, you, you misconstrue that as, you know, that, that everyone says when the, you're selling drugs on any sort of larger level that you get addicted to the power just as much as the money. And that's certainly true. Being in that town, um, I was very scared of, of law enforcement, as you had mentioned. Being in a smaller town means that I'm more vulnerable and I'm more exposed. And I can clearly remember I'd have two, three hundred thousand dollars cash in my safe. I had a gun at my house, uh, which, like I said, I, I didn't need a gun, but it was just kind of went with. Part of the whole situation. It was part of the whole situation. And I remember I had a girlfriend at the time, and every single night, I'd lay in bed and I could like literally hear my heart thumping because I didn't know if the next morning they were going to come for me. You know, I, I just didn't know 
If, when, if it was, time, when you're dry, when you're just going to the store, or going somewhere, does it just feel like, oh, I, everyone knows I'm Ryan, the drug dealer? It became that way. Um, I was young, so I was definitely more materialistic than I am now. I drove the Tahoe with the 24s, and you know, I had the system, and I was very loud about it. I wasn't very smart as far as putting it out there, so. People started knowing, and yeah, I'd run into people, and there'd be whispers, and it wasn't always a positive thing. People recognized me for that specific reason that I was a big drug dealer. And by the end, just as any drug endeavor goes, drug dealing endeavor goes, uh, I essentially hired runners to, in a managerial uh, capacity, to do everything. And I kind of just stayed at home, I kept my connection secret. I brokered it, but I did very minimal work. And uh, I mean, yeah, it was the, the worst part about it was the fear of impending doom with law enforcement because it could be, it could be any second. What happened is my addiction got so bad that the girlfriend that I had at the time put me into a treatment center in Pasadena. It's actually the same treatment center that they do celebrity rehab at now, uh, or they filmed it there. Uh, it's called Pasadena Recovery Center, and I went there uh, to come off the heroin and. I ended up getting a credit card in the mail one day uh, in my name. I guess my, my mail had been forwarded to this treatment center and it had a credit card in there with like a $20,000 limit. And I took that as, you know, I'm just going to leave here and I'm going to go relapse, which seemed to be a pattern with me. It was cyclical with uh, my failed attempts at treatment. And I go out and I find, you know, street level kind of paisa guy, barely speaks English. And I buy some balloons of heroin with him. I go get the cash advance with the credit card. And from that moment on, I brought some of that heroin. They were in multicolored balloons. I brought them up to Santa Barbara. And they were so good compared to what was going on in Santa Barbara. Because we have Oxford or uh, Oxnard in between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. And, uh, you know, the Southsiders, the Mexican gangbangers, it's kind of like this place where they intercept it. Anything that goes from Santa Barbara to LA. Uh, is intercepted in Oxford and usually cut on. So by the time we get drugs there, it's not as pure or clean as they would be in LA. So everyone was very excited about the heroin that I was bringing. They're like, this is the best heroin around. I mean, we, we're not getting stuff like this. And again, I, been, I basically invented the market. I was getting the balloons for $3 a piece. They were a point two. I was selling them for $25 a piece but in quantity at 100 a time. That's what my runners were paying, and they were charging 40 a piece for them. And the reason that those prices existed, interestingly enough, it was right in the wake of the Oxycontin epidemic. And so you have a lot of people that are used to paying a dollar a milligram for Oxycontin. They're paying $80 for an 80 milligram pill. They're paying uh, you know, sometimes half of that, $40 for an 80, whatever. So they're already used to paying a lot of money for a little teeny pill. So now we're giving them a little balloon of heroin, and it, it, like it, created, it created the market. So that's how I was getting away with selling them for $25 a piece. And I got three runners below me, and they would work for me. And basically, I had a runner from another runner, one of hers. I, my connection was, was that, that guy I told you about, the guy that barely spoke English. You just randomly met him on the street? I met him on the street just trying to score when I AWOLed from rehab. And um, he eventually went to prison for, uh, I think, uh, re-entry or something, something like that, right? He called me with a cell phone from prison. So it shut down for a little bit, and he said, hey, my girl's out there, and she wants to pick up where, where we left off. So he introduced me to a woman named um, Diana Ortiz, and I started dealing with her for maybe two years. So now I'm about 23, and we had such a good system in place where this you know, this Paisa runner would come up twice a week and he'd deliver a pound in balloons on a Monday and on a Friday. And, and we'd exchange the money. You wanted them prepackaged or that she- I, I wanted them prepackaged because that's what the market was calling for. So um, I, I think it was, I got it down to 8,000 for a pound. And you know- uh, Mexican months. Yeah, it's like 2,000 balloons. And like I said, each balloon I'm selling for $25, even in quantity. So the profit margin there is just 